Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar uh, about AFM in SEM analysis in material science. I'm Veronika Higrova, and today uh, we, we're going to have approximately 30 to 40 minutes webinar uh, about the analysis in material science. Uh, as we are broadcasting, there's a little delay, uh, but don't worry. Uh, I would like to encourage you to ask questions in the chat window. Uh, my colleagues will be answering them uh, during the webinar. And at the end, we will uh, choose few of them, uh, interesting ones, which I will answer aloud. So first, le let me introduce the company. Uh, we are Nanovision company. Uh, we are coming from Brno uh, in the central of Europe. Uh, we are home to, well, Brno is home to exceptional universities and research institutions, and it's a leading center of scientific instrumentation development. And so it's more than 70 years of history related to electron microscopy. So there is no surprise that uh, there is a lot of microscopy community and many startup companies are uh, created here. Nanovision is a spin-off of Brno University of Technology and the Central European Institute of Technology. And except us, there are huge uh, names like Thermo Fisher Scientific, Tescan, Orsay Holdings, DeLong Instruments, and many more like uh, Masaryk University or Institute of Scientific Instruments. And so what do we do? Uh, Nanovision, uh, as Nanovision, we develop LightScope. It's a unique atomic force microscope, which can be, which is designed to be integrated into scanning electron microscopes. Uh, as you can see the chamber here, the objective and so on. Uh, LightScope is sitting on the stage and uh, uh, in this way, we are measuring with both micro microscopes simultaneously. Uh, the scope of the webinar uh, will be that, uh, first of all, I'd like to say a few challenges in material sciences. Uh, sciences. Then I'd like to get into the CPAM technology, correlative probe and electron microscopy technology. And then I'd like to go further into the application examples in material sciences. At the end, as I said earlier, there will be time for questions. And so uh, what are the challenges in the material science? In material sciences, there are several demands on the materials to be used in a real applications. For, in, for instance, the lightness and strength of materials are one of the key factors in the automotive or airspace, uh, airspace industry, as well as surviving extreme environments and being resistant to corrosion and high temperatures. All of them can increase, uh, if we know how it works, it can increase the lifetime efficiency and lower the costs. Uh, for these reasons, new designs of steels, the use of coatings or other composite materials are studied. Uh, for instance, in the case of uh, elect in electronic devices, in order to improve their performance and memory while reducing its size, uh, the understanding of intrinsic properties on an atomic scale is crucial. And so uh, what we, we'd like to talk about today is uh, we're, we're going to have a few examples in uh, low dimensional materials, in steels, metal alloys, in batteries, ceramics, and polymer composite materials. And in these, uh, uh, there are a few challenges with, uh, or several ch challenges with analysis. Uh, for low dimensional materials, there are, for instance, precise targeting. Uh, as well multimodal analysis to understand the shape, sizes, composition, or electrical properties and so on are quite important. Or for some of the materials, uh, oxidation can happen on air or other unwanted reactions. Uh, 
and if we uh, take uh, AFM in SEM solution, or it can be also other correlative microscopy analysis, usually what is a problem to transfer the sample, or it can be quite far away or very close, but anyway, we need to transfer the sample. What can happen during the time, uh, except the time consuming uh, and lower efficiency in the measurements, is that the sample surface gets contaminated or changes its properties. And then how we can correlate the data when we don't know if the sample surface is the same or not. Uh, another topic uh, is the localization to area of interest, which in small structures like uh, one dimensional materials, uh, it can be quite tricky to localize to area of interest. Uh, with the light scope, we, uh, uh, we are measuring several techniques uh, from mechanical properties. They are, uh, for instance, topography, energy dissipation, nano indentation, measurement of low, uh, elastical properties, or uh, from electrical properties, we can measure uh, conductivity mapping, uh, local surface potential, IV curves, and so on in uh, high resolution. Uh, another one is measuring of piezoelectric domains and or magnetic domain imaging. And all of these we can measure in SEM, as you can see in the middle one is the scheme of SEM chamber. But how we do that? Uh, we are using correlative microscopy. Uh, so it's called CPAM technology. And so uh, as we have here a uh, light scope sitting on the stage, uh, then it's a bit different principle how uh, the simultaneous acquisition uh, works. So if we have a look, we have electron beam pointing focused very close to the AFM probe. Uh, as you can see, the tip has little offset with the electron beam and both of them are staying static. We are measuring with while scanning with the sample, detecting uh, the signals from SEM, from detectors of electron microscope, microscope and we are uh, obtaining data from the probe. In this way, we get the correlative uh, image. In this case, in 3D, we have the topography, and covered with the material contrast from the uh, SC, uh, secondary electrons. So those are the basic principles on which we utilize when measuring um, in material sciences. And so let's get to the application examples. Uh, there are several examples from these fields. Uh, I will start from the low dimensional materials and then we continue further with with other materials. So in two dimensional materials, the analysis of uh, uh, the complex analysis in in situ conditions are quite important. For instance, uh, measuring or analyzing the how thin the material is or how it grows is quite important. In that case, we need to know the targeting. The pre we need to know where we are. Uh, another thing we need to know uh, the what is the material. So uh, as well, EDS can help and the topography, how much it, it have grown is also so important. Uh, till now, uh, graphene is a huge topic or other two di dimensional materials as well. It's a promising nanomaterial with unique properties but still uh, the production which would be reproducible is still unsolved. So if we, there are several analyzes what to do with it. And uh, in our case, we were measuring uh, on the very edge, as we can see from the white part and dark part, uh, the edge where the graphene stopped growing. And so we were able to navigate exactly to the location of interest and measure from the same area uh, secondary electrons and uh, AFM topography. 
And if we put it together, we see exactly where the graphene starts to grow. And we also see the inclination of silicon carbide terraces. So in this way, we can understand what, where it starts to grow. Uh, graphene is used in many different, uh, is created in other ways as well. So as we can see, we have a graphene on copper and you can see that uh, the roughness is different on the graphene and on the copper. It is because copper got oxidized and graphene stayed, uh, the copper under graphene stayed unoxidized. So we can see the roughness over here. And also graphene is studied as if we uh, deform it in some way, uh, it can create single photon emitters or the photoluminescent changes changes of monolayers. Another reason to put it on uh, gold nanoparticles is that the photoluminescence gets much higher. So if we measure some small biomolecules, then we can see much higher signal. And LightScope in this case helped us to measure uh, with high resolution in and in in situ conditions, the topography, and we could see how homogeneous the graphene is or not. It was quite easy to localize as the flakes are quite small. And uh, CPEM provided us a um, meaningful illustration of how it looks like in 3D. Uh, another example I have uh, from thin layer of bismuth ferrite. It's a multifaric uh, perovskite material, which was uh, created by A uh, ALD. And uh, this material could be used in magnetism, spintronics or photovoltaics. And this material is studied uh, because um, the deposition process, understanding of the deposition process and the quality control is, is quite important. As it, and if we have a look in a CM, uh, we get quite confusing data because we don't know what the black part is. And we don't know why these parts are different from the everything else. So, but if we uh, combine it with topography, we can see that the uh, dotted part is actually a bubble as visible in the blue graph and the dark part is just a small it's not even a hole uh, it's a, uh, it's why it's black it's only because of the material contrast as we have the conductive and non-conductive uh, materials here and then the color changes and so as we can see in three dimensional material uh, in CPAM view, we can have a look exactly how it looks like. And so AFM in a CM uh, solution provided us easy and fast navigation and a complex multimodal uh, characterization, which we measured simultaneously. What we could add to the measurement is as well the, the MFM or surface potential which could under, uh, help us to understand the thin films and its properties more. Uh, I have one more uh, low dimensional material. It's molybdenum disulfide flake. It was uh, deposited on the copper substrate. Uh, it's a unique material which could be used in automotive or semiconductor chemistry or airspace industry. And for that reason, we need to understand the microstructure, the defects, mechanical properties, and understand the fabrica fabrication processes. So as we can see, we measured uh, secondary and backscatter electrons with EDS composition and the topography. There could be also mechanical properties measured. And uh, and so we could correlate these channels together. Uh, in the steels and alloys, uh, I have to, or why is it interesting uh, to measure uh, correlatively? Because uh, they have also 
quite they, it's quite important to, in an automotive industry to have very uh, uh, light materials with good with the good strength and for that reason uh, we are measuring it with diff uh, and we are measuring different steels and alloys together uh, in this case I have chosen a calcium rich precipitation uh, of an alloy it's a prospective biodegradable material so we are going more to biology to the to use in prosthetics and in order to use it in prosthetics it needs to be hardened more and uh, the precipitates are quite similar to uh, the structures uh, which are just impurities uh, as we, if we take the shape or size composition is different but also the surface potential is different so if we take this uneven surface uh, there are only few precipitates which are uh, there and so for that reason we used SEM very nice localization to those islands and we use the surface potential measurement by KPFM uh, to recognize them and navigate and say which one is uh, how many of precipitates are there. Uh, in case of ferritic austenitic duplex steel, it's a material uh, which uh, is studied for the because of corrosion uh, to be used in the industrial applications. And uh, in this case, we can see that there are different phases of material, material even during the uh, between the one grain. And so as well to understand the properties, complex analysis is important. We can see the size of the grain. We can see where it changes and more uh, other uh, properties can be measured there. Uh, we stay with the steels uh, because mechanical properties are quite important as well in the automotive industry. And so we can use a nano indentation module on the light scope. We can see uh, the indenter tip, in this case, in this case, Berkovich tip. It has a bit different uh, configuration that we have. Uh, like 19 degrees different than usual and we can measure the secondary backscattered electrons to see the uh, different phases to recognize them and then we can measure the hardness and young modulus as we see over here and we can measure the roughness to know how much we can go in the depth but also to see uh, the pileup effects uh, to for correction of our calculations uh, in young modulus. And if we uh, continue further in the applications, so let's get into the powder particles. Uh, I have an example from pharmaceutics, uh, but also in additive manufacturing and coatings uh, of particles or for coloring, painting, uh, can be used and usually what are the troubles with the analysis here are the tip navigation uh, because the structures are in a way quite small or big how we can uh, depends on the scale and what we need but for the tip it's quite big and so but for the optical microscope it's quite small to navigate exactly to this location and so it's uh, quite easy for us to navigate thanks to SEM uh, that we are able to go exactly to the location of interest and get into the hard to reach places. Also the live observation is possible and so we can create new uh, experimental designs to control for instance the roughness measure uh, roughness of particles. Uh, if we continue in, into the battery research, we stay with the powder particles. Uh, let's take the cathode active material for rechargeable lithium ion batteries. 
uh, it, the conductivity is studied to prolong the battery lifetime uh, and also to prevent the uh, unwanted reactions. Uh, coating of the particles is studied. As I said before, with the powder par particles, it's quite difficult to uh, navigate the probe into the location of interest uh, without breaking the tip. And so what we did here, we measured the uh, secondary electrons here, uh, the topography and the conductivity map of the particles. And uh, what we found out, uh, it's a proof of concept measurement where we will continue in it. But what we found out that the coating is mainly conductive along the edges, but some parts uh, are completely dark, even though they, they should be conductive from the first uh, theory. And so, um, uh, LightScope in this case helped us to measure in in-situ conditions because uh, these batteries are, or, or the powder particles for batteries are uh, air susceptible samples, so they easily oxidize on, the, on air. And we could correlate all the data together and later on maybe we find out why uh, it's not conductive. It could be because it wasn't fabricated well or we will see. And it helped us to precisely identify the grains and we are sure we are on the right spot. Let's move into the ceramics. Uh, I have here a ceramic film of aluminium scandium nitride. It was grown on uh, grown film on the silicon chip, and it's a promising new material material to replace conventional aluminium nitride in radio uh, frequency filter application uh, applications in inside mobile phones. So first of all, we measured the topography and uh, CPEM. Uh, inside the chamber, and then we uh, measured the piezo response force microscopy. But why? Uh, because scandium is more efficient mechanical to electrical uh, conversion, thanks to increased electromechanical coupling and piezoelectric uh, coefficient of the material. And so what we measured in this case, we measured uh, amplitude and phase. Uh, while uh, using uh, applying alternating voltage on the sample. And so uh, we can see in the image amplitude and the phase of the piezo response of the grown material. And there over here we see the topography with the PFM uh, phase in this case on top of it. And so let's move to tungsten chromium hafnium co composite. Uh, this composite is a prospective material for fusion reactors. And uh, what is important to uh, analyze the defects of uh, in the material um, because the mater material has a, uh, or the defects of the material have significant effect on the performance and lifetime uh, uh, of the material. And so what we measured here, we measured secondary electrons, backscattered electrons, the topography, and then we uh, took a few uh, height, height profiles here. And if we have a look in the red part, we have some uh, pores or which seem to be for pores in SEM, but if we have a look in uh, the topography, we see that they are quite different, depends on which one, uh, which uh, red uh, circle we take. And so it means that some of them are pores, uh, so it was correct, but some of them are not. And so some of them are most probably the hafnium inclusions, not the pores. So if we take the height profile over here, we see the hafnium particle uh, between the two pores. So this analysis is not possible uh, with separate uh, instruments because, or 
it always is. You can use the focused IMB milling or other so scratching the sample, but it's always time, time consuming and di quite difficult. And so uh, uh, I'd like if you are interested, uh, we have our local partners around the world and so you can contact our local partners. Or you can have a look at more applications as I was talking only about the material science on our web page are more from nanostructures, semiconductors, life sciences. And or we have our social media where we uh, regularly post. Or on our YouTube channel, we have more product vi with videos and webinars which you can have a look. Uh, Till the end of the year and beginning of the of the next year, we are gonna have more conferences where you can meet you can meet with us. We have uh, in the middle of October we have MSNT, then uh, in the United States, then we have in German Germany during the same time, the end of October Nanocon in Brno in Czech Republic, and then we will be again in the States, uh, and the beginning of the year are in uh, Germany. I'd like to summarize my talk. Uh, I was talking about uh, needs in material science as uh, enhanced performance or improved performance of devices and durable materials uh, to other environments are quite important and in the modern life we want to improve it even more. The reproducible production of uh, low dimensional materials to be used uh, in electronic devices are uh, very much studied to be used and also as well precise targeting is important in multimodal analysis to understand the principles uh, which are happening on, on the nanoscale. Also, we'd like to prevent the unwanted reactions and contamination. That's why we try to uh, avoid in some of the materials transferring between the instruments. And with AFM in SEM solution, uh, we are able to cor correlate the true data from different uh, microscopes from SEM and AFM, and, and so it creates uh, more, more capable, more capabilities to uh, scanning electron microscope. And in this way, uh, we have a tool where we can measure more, uh, more properties in once. Also, it's possible to use a uh, uh, focused ion beam or gas injection system in SEM to modify the surface and measure it in, in once right away, right away. And we can uh, precisely navigate the tip to measure uh, at the same spot in the same uh, uh, conditions in once. And so uh, I was talking about the application examples in material science, such as uh, low dimensional materials, steels, batteries, uh, ceramics, composites, and, and so on. Uh, so let's get into the questions. There were a few of them, so uh, I will read a few of them loud. So the first one was, can you move the tip and SEM beam in synchronization? It seems very difficult as different SEMs will have different drivers. Uh, so we don't have the uh, we we have a different approach. We are not moving with the uh, tip and with the electron beam. Instead of that, we are uh, moving with the scanner. And so the offset is still the same. And so we don't have to as well. We don't have to communicate between two softwares, the UI of SCM and NanoView software. So uh, Offset is still the same, and at the end, the post -proce first pro post processing is just shifting uh, and correlating it into one. So pixel to pixel are the same. Uh, the second one is: Is it difficult to change or replace the AFM probe tip? 
also the uh, is the probe tip proprietary or can be can any compatible probe tip be used? Uh, the replacement of the probe is quite easy as we have uh, dedicated holders where we put the probe and mount it into the uh, scanning head. And you can use uh, different probes. Uh, you can see it in a, uh, our web page. And another thing, we, we cannot use all conventional probes. We are using self-sensing and self-actuating probes. So this is the main difference. So we are not using the optical detection system uh, but instead we are reading it from the probe. And there is one more. Uh, do you observe some shift or drifting in AFM scanning or you are usually performing the scans without the beam being on? Uh, you can use both options. If you'd like to measure with the beam off, it's also possible or you can visualize what is happening uh, with the tip while measuring. It can be very good for uh, spectroscopy modes such as force distance measurement. You can see if something is happening uh, cor in a correct manner or not. So it's not like you blindly have a curve, you don't know what happened, uh, even though you have a, a different probe than a different curve than before. And during the measurement, there, there can be some drift. Uh, however, we developed uh, artificial intelligence optimization that can automatically deal with uh, the drift uh, in electron beam. Uh, usually the drift depends on the uh, charging of the sample. If the sample is charging, there probably will be some drift. If it's fully conductive sample, usually it's not the case. Uh, well, uh, that was the last question. And so with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have any question, don't, uh, don't hesitate to write us uh, to application at nanovision.com. And otherwise, have a nice day. Thank you.